So I'm a, I'm a social psychologist who studies morality, and my, my second book was called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. So I've spent my entire career basically trying to answer that question. And the way I would urge you to think about it is, think about it like this. So we evolved to be, we evolved as group living primates who live in small groups that are constantly struggling against other groups, often violently. Um, we have, uh, we evolved to have small scale religions and, and treat things as sacred to bind us together. Um, I'm a devotee of the sociologist Emile Durkheim, who's the greatest analyst of religion and, and group solidarity ever. So that's the way we've lived for all of human history with constant violence and struggle and the, the Guiding principle is the Bedouin proverb, me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me, my brother and cousin against the stranger. We're really good at forming teams to fight whoever it is that we need to fight. And this is like everybody or war movie ever. You know, there's a conflict between them, but then, you know, they, they come together to fight the foreign enemy. Um, so uh, then something amazing happened um, beginning, uh, beginning in the enlightenment that ways of living together um, not based on blood or, or land, but um, based on citizenship and rights emerged. And so we have this long period of developing institutions that enabled liberal democracy. And then liberal democracy has this amazing run in the 20th century, despite all the barbarism, despite all the murder, the 20th century actually had the lowest death rate from violence in all of human history. And then of course, once we get through World War II, the rate of violence and genocide plummets. So we have this amazing run culminating in the 1990s when we thought, wow, we did it. Liberal democracy won. And from here on in, just, you know, let's just wait for North Korea and Iran to, let, you know, let them get property rights and let them get wealth and they're gonna want rights too, like we're done. So that's what we thought, we were completely wrong um, because Human nature is tribal in this way, and our, our incredible peace and prosperity that we, that we got by the late 20th century was based on, on all kinds of parameters and institutions, and, and this was the end of the age of mass media, which is a very important part of the story. There was a way to, to all have the same news and, and have some common understandings of who we were and what we were doing. Now, there was always contested, but it was contested like not like a thousand different narratives changing every five minutes. So there was a period of, of, of intellectual or informational stability, comparatively speaking. Um, and the high point of that was the 1990s and then social media, well, first the internet comes in. The internet actually is not the problem. As the internet comes in, in the 90s and early 2000s, mental health doesn't drop and democracy keeps rising. But then we get social media on smartphones in 2008, 2009 is when that begins to get common. Um, and in, at 2012 to 2014 is the period where everything turns. Um, that's what I was arguing in my article, that it's the, the presence of ubiquitous social media, and especially Twitter. Twitter has had an enormously destructive effect on institutions. Everyone's afraid of saying anything, because if you say anything in any context, you never know what will happen to you. And you could be shamed, not just you know in your community, but globally. So at least that's my argument is, we're living way above our design constraints. We had a good run of it. Now we're crashing and we don't know where the bottom is. I think it's gonna go on for several decades. We're not gonna work this out in the next 10 or 20 years. So um, this is the task for your generation. I hope you'll all major in the social sciences, study sociology and political science, and figure out how we can live together with digital technology. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's, it, it's great to be here, and I'm honored to share a stage uh, with Dr. Haidt. Um, I, I agree with a, a lot of what he's saying. I certainly agree with the idea that um, humans are inherently tribal, and that conflict um, is something that is probably sort of innate, and I, I view it as a Christian as, as, as part of our sinful nature. Um, I think the thing that saddens me the most about this current political moment in this country is that where I see Christ being able to offer solutions, the people who claim to be following him clearly are not doing that, and they're just making the problem worse. Um, and so that points me in the direction as a political scientist to understanding where a lot of this polarization um, is coming from. And while I don't disagree with, uh, with Jonathan that 
um, social media has exacerbated the problem. These things actually predate the rise um, of social media and, and Facebook, and it's important for us to acknowledge the things that were the precursors to this. Um, and oftentimes what we saw was people organizing and they just didn't necessarily have the same tools that we have now with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok to be able to do it. So imagine what they could have done if like Facebook were 50 or 70 years old at this point, which would actually be somewhat frightening. So, um, you know, some of the things that we think about in terms of, of, of polarization, um, I'm very persuaded by the notion of ideological sorting um, in political science, sort of proffered by Matt Lavendusky, amongst others, that suggests that in particular in our politics, we used to have these big tent political parties um, that were more regional in, in their orientation, and then we started to see this shift, um, particularly amongst uh, Southern whites from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. And so what this ends up doing is this ends up creating um, these really strong correlations between ideology and party that didn't exist before, um, particularly among whites. This is actually not true among people of color, but that sorting where you have liberal, um, where all the liberals are Democrats and all the conservatives are Republicans means that there aren't moderating influences within the parties, and so both groups have become um, more extreme. Um, and, 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 and that's something that actually fixing gerrymandering isn't going to fix. Um, and so it's important for us to acknowledge that this is not a, you know, we should just like, you know, let the fox in the hen house and have partisans like, you know, draw all their lines to their benefit. But we have to acknowledge that there are going to be limits to what that fix is going to be able to do for us. Um, I think we also have to acknowledge that our vantage point and our comparison point is the middle part of the 20th century. And there are problems for all sorts of reasons. So to what was perceived as actually being um, you know, pretty harmonious and, and, and not being particularly polarized left a lot of people out of the discussion. Um, and uh, you know, it's important for us to recognize that that exclusion happened. It's also important for us to recognize that that, that that period actually may have been the outlier as opposed to being the norm. And just because of when all of us were born, we use it as a different vantage point. We hold it up as our standard. And and so there were certain things that happened then that maybe also contributed to it. So there is a certain cultural homo homogeneity in terms of the elite, um, but they also had unifying experiences. And so maybe the reason why members of Congress got along so well um, you know, in the 1950s and 60s and even into the 1970s was the fact that most of them were um, veterans of World War II. And so they all had this common language and this common experience that people don't have anymore. Um, when Robert Putnam wrote his seminal book in the late 90s, bowling alone and he talked about social capital this idea that people look out for each other and so communities that have this thing where people care about their communities they're invested they volunteer they you know get their neighbors paper if if it's left out on the lawn you know they call if they haven't seen people in a couple of days you know one of the things he noted sadly was that um, social capital uh, tends to be really high in homogeneous communities and so the downside of diversity oftentimes is you don't get those connections and I think the lesson for us all is that we have to work harder at it when are people who are different. Like it's easy when you all speak the same language, um, whether that's literal or a cultural language or a religious language or an identity-based language. Um, but when people are different, you're going to have to work harder to build community. But it's something um, that is, in, in fact, worthwhile. Um, I think one of the things that has happened today is this notion of othering. Um, and so it manifests itself in politics through the idea of what my colleague Alan Abramowitz calls negative partisanship. I am what I am because I'm not what those people are, right? And other forms of othering, sometimes when you um, view people as um, dangerous, sometimes when you start to view people as subhuman, like this is, this, this, is, this is the point where you start to see violence. This is the point where genocide happens. And we're at a, a really critical inflection point in our society where you can't see people who disagree with you, not just as just, you know, being well-meaning, but perhaps wrong, or that you disagree with them, but that you see them as dangerous and that you need to take them out, and and that's the thing that we're going to have to uh, we're, we're going to have to uh, you know steady ourselves against and make sure that we're actually willing to to fight and put some skin in the game to resist because that's where it's going to be hard to put our society back together. Yeah. How do you solve that right here on the campus? Yeah. Well, first, I think having events like this, and that's why I agreed to do this, because we, you know, most people want to talk. Most people don't like what's going on. And so you know, events like this, taking part in them, uh, there's going to be some you know, table discussions. Veritas has created some, some programming. Um, I created a thing uh, called the Open Mind Program. I, it's actually, or we had to change our name. It's, but if you go to uh, Constructive Dialogue, uh, .org. We have a, a program that you can use in any group that teaches skills of constructive uh, interaction. Um, this is a superpower for you. 
um, when you graduate, you're going to work in companies where the leadership is just horrified at their young employees. They're, they're really difficult to work with, their young employees, because they don't have these basic skills of, of speaking and talking and not taking offense if someone challenges you. But if you develop them, you are super hireable and you'll be happier. You'll be like a social superhero. So, um, so um, learn these skills, um, speak up respectfully, and you'll learn basic things like start by saying where you think the person is right, or even before that, even before that, find some things you have in common. You know, like, uh, you know, when I, when, when I sat down at dinner, you know, I'd, I, I knew that I, I'd looked her up. I'd say, oh, we're, you know, we're UV, you know, you're UVA together. We start talking about that. Like, and that, was, that was just normal politeness. But had it been a riskier encounter, I would have done it very strategically. Mm -hmm. Let's find some things we have in common. You know, and then, you know, I would say some things. I would listen to you. Uh, oh, we had the, oh, was anyone here at the Daryl Davis event, the, uh, the um, Veritas Forum with Daryl Davis a couple years ago? That was incredible. You just look up Daryl Davis, watch his videos. He is the master at this. He is a black man who has talked hundreds of Ku Klux Klan members out of their robes, largely by listening to them. It's incredible. Learn his skills. So you can, you know, our country is breaking, our society is breaking, our institutions are breaking, uh, but you can build them up from the ground up and you can create, you can create networks of decency and humanity around you. So um, I'm gonna give three answers. Um, so two that I'm gonna call structural and then one that I'm gonna call individual. So my structural answers are education and leadership and then the individual answer um, involves humility. Um, so I'm gonna start with leadership first. Um, you know, I, I, I do think about how I choose my words, because words matter. I don't necessarily view it as walking on eggshells. I just partially view this as being empathetic and a, and a decent human being sometimes. Um, but one of the things that I think I can do in my capacity and in the authority and power that I have as a professor is to sort of impart wisdom um, to my students, sometimes through the lessons that I teach. So at my university, I teach the Intro to American um, Politics class. At some point, you're gonna have to go over civil rights and civil liberties. We cover the First Amendment. I'm probably gonna do it in about 10 minutes in a class. Um, but one of the things that I think is actually really important to share with people is, is what the First Amendment protects, um, and that um, it may not protect all forms of hate speech, particularly if they lead to violence. Um, then it's a problem. Um, but just because somebody says something that's disagreeable, even if it looks like it's impugning um, you or your community, right, there still is a, a person's First Amendment right to say something that could be perceived as, as, a, as offensive to people. And that opens up an opportunity to at least have a discussion about, okay, here's what you should be mad about, and then here's what you're gonna have to fight back with more speech. Right? And, and so that's the beauty of the First Amendment, is that when people say things that are crazy, the response should not be to censor them um, unless it really is going to like lead to, like directly lead to violence. It's to counter back, to ask questions, to push back. Like you have, as much as they have a First Amendment right to say something that offends you, you have a First Amendment right to say, I am offended and here is why, and explain it. And then perhaps you have the opportunity to um, elevate the conversation. I also think that a lot of the problem that we have is a result of leadership. So at a national level, um, the reason why, and I think it's important to point out that Democrats are capable of the same excesses that, that we see Republicans doing now, they just haven't done it yet in the same way, right? But it doesn't mean that 20 years from now we might be talking about the crazy Democratic Party. Um, I would hope that for that, you know, in a generation we're past that with both parties, but um, we never know. I think it's important. My human nature is what it is, and so um, Democrats don't have some lock on virtue here. But what we see happening in the Republican Party now is some people who know better, right? My friends who are lobbyists, um, you hear this kind of in some of the chit chat of reporters, right? They know what these folks say behind the scenes, and they know this is all messed up, but they are so intent on winning and gaining power that they are not willing to actually speak truth 
to the masses and lead, right? Because some of this is based on genuine misinformation and these people are in a position to know and to explain and to actually maybe not persuade everybody but to at least be taken seriously. And there are people who are not willing to lose an election, lose a fight on a particular battle. And, 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 and the irony is, is that Christ tells us sort of just from a broader spiritual standpoint that you have to lose your life in order to gain it, but like you're not willing to do that in politics. So you've just made this thing your idol. And this, that type of idolatry that is leading us in the mess that we're in because a lot of those folks know better. Um, you know, the other sort of part of that is at, at the university level is that there may be times where a dean of students or a university president might need to use something as a teaching moment. So to use the University of Virginia, my undergraduate alma mater, as an example, um, Mike Pence was invited to speak. People threw a fit. I get why you don't like his politics. Um, but in, in sort of just in talking about the marketplace of ideas, um, also, just in terms of the tone, um, like you should let Mike Pence have his say, and then you can ask hard questions after the fact. I do understand that there are some speakers. I was actually, years ago, I did a Veritas event the week after there was a shooting at an event with a far right speaker. Like, I get not inviting that type of, of, of speaker to a campus, but Mike Pence isn't likely to bring, like, people shooting um, with him. So I don't think from a public safety standpoint, you should be worried um, about that. And I think that it's actually more important to, to, to go and register dissent by being willing to show up and listen and engage than to say, I don't wanna hear you know, what this person has to say. And I would say the same thing for somebody who uh, you know, might have a, 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 a far left point of view that you know, wasn't extremist and anarchist as well. Um, and so like, the structural things. I think sometimes there are people who are too interested in obtaining and maintaining power by being popular as opposed to doing what they know to be right. I think for you know each of us individually, regardless of the amount of power that we perceive that we have, we can govern our individual attitudes and behavior. And so one of the things that we do need to think about is approaching others in a spirit of humility and approaching in love. Um, and so, um, you know, we say God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble when we're thinking about our vertical relationship with God. But I mean, Proverbs also says that, or Proverbs says that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And oftentimes that's a lot of the problem is, is that you think you have it all figured out and nobody can say anything to you and you give that vibe off. Um, and then it's actually repellent. And it actually makes people less likely to want to listen to you and to uh, take you seriously and the things that you have to say. So I think we have to be very mindful um, about doing that. And we also have to check ourselves about othering other people, even when we think that they're like really, really stupid. Um, I was thinking sort of in preparation for this about uh, Jonah. And so we all know the story about Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He goes in the opposite direction. He gets swallowed by the big fish. But like we don't always think about like the second half of the book where he goes to Nineveh and they repent. He carries the message God told him to do. And then he's mad that they repent because he just didn't like those people. And he pretty much wanted them to go to hell. So um, like, what does that say about us? And what does that say about Jonah after having gone through this traumatic experience that's like, you still like, don't get it, dude. Um, but we can be like that sometimes. And so sometimes the reason why we want to other people is that if we have this sixth sense of we make ourselves feel better, by not being like that other group, whatever that is, right? I think we have to do our own self-examination and, 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 and look really hard at, at, at what's going on with us and allow God to change that. Like there are things that we could probably do affirmatively ourselves. I think that that's the type of thing that involves deep spiritual work that you know, I think only the Holy Spirit can do um, in our lives and we should avail ourselves to that.